Happy Friday, Baylor College Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, Bill Gates got me in a lot of trouble. And the reason for that is he just came out with his book on how to prevent the next pandemic. And he didn't reference Lily once. And as you, about a year ago, Lily presented her plan for presenting the pandemic. And she wanted to know if Bill Gates' dogs wrote it. And I didn't, you know, I got a lot of service recovery here. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to hear Lily's 10 point plan at the end because she told me I have to present it. So what's going on in the world today? Uh, Beijing and Hong Kong still don't have outbreaks. Uh, Shanghai is in full lockdown. You know, you got to wonder about <laughs> China's zero COVID tolerance policies. Now we're going to so great. Uh, there are outbreaks in South Africa, uh, probably due to the B4, B5 variants. We don't really know yet. Puerto Rico is having a big surge, six times the number of cases that are in the rest of the United States. And the emergency, and, and as always, the European Union, they're always declaring victory over something. Uh, they have now decided the pandemic is essentially over, so uh, they have loosened all restrictions. And in th this next week coming up, they're actually going to uh, stop uh, uh, enforcing masks on airlines and things like that. And Italy, which was one of the most aggressive European countries in terms of um, uh, restricting activities and wearing masks and showing proof of vaccination, has thrown all that out the window. So there's about 11.6 billion vaccines that have been administered, including 1.9 billion uh, booster shots. But, you know, obviously it's highly uh, variable. The Western countries uh, who can afford it are getting vaccinated. Much of Africa remains uh, unvaccinated. And if you look at the, the uh, world map, it's about the same as it's always been. Uh, Europe is still pretty high, Australia high, but this is a point in time. It's sometimes better to look at trends. And if you look at the trends, Europe is really coming down and the U.S. is beginning to move up. And even though the map, like by based on the number of cases per 100,000, seems like it's bad in Europe, but we're about the same. Europe and the U.S. are getting very much the same. So, Janet, if you still want to go to Europe, go ahead and get your second booster. Uh, what's going on in the U.S.? Uh, new, new cases have doubled, uh, mostly due to the new Omicron variants. Uh, some states like Hawaii, Maine, and Puerto Rico are almost back to what they were last summer's uh, Delta surge. Hospitalizers are, hospitalizations are beginning to go up a bit. They're up about 20 percent, mostly driven by what's going on in New England, the New York, and the, uh, the Northeast. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, if you really think about it, there's so many cases being diagnosed at home now that I think most of the incident data is probably way under estimation. The good news is that the death rate seems to be coming down. Uh, we've been having fewer than 400 deaths nationwide uh, due to COVID. If you recall, just a, just a few months ago, we were up as high as 2,600. So that's all very good. <clears throat> If you look at what's going on in the U.S. in terms of cases, you can see this upswing. We've been predicting this, you know, from the beginning that we would see an uptick. Hopefully it won't turn into a spike, but it's clearly going up. We've had an increase in cases by almost 50 percent, but mortality rate has stayed down. So we're, we're not seeing a big surge there, but we still only have 66 percent of the country vaccinated. Uh, in Texas, Dimmit County, our friends in Dimmit County, home of the Javelinas, they're doing great. Uh, they're, they're really very low. Harris County, our uh, Houston County here, uh, is now moved up to moderate uh, risk because we're seeing more and more cases above 20. And in fact, the Texas Medical Center data, our catchment area, which is mostly Harris County, moves, we were down to 300 cases. We're back up to 645, which is from very little risk now back to moderate risk. And the only good news about that is that the hospitalizations remain about the same. So we're still at somewhere around 60 hospitalizations per day. The CDC uh, is trying to forecast what's going to happen. And yeah, I love these forecasts. You can see that there is a sense that there's going to be an uptick, but the confidence intervals are so broad that, you know, it's really hard to predict. It's going to be very much dependent upon what happens with these variants. If we get a more infectious variant, you know, we might be back in another surge. Uh, worldwide, it's interesting to sort of begin to look back on what the effect of the uh, pandemic has had worldwide in terms of mortality. So there's been over 5.5 million deaths that have been attributed to COVID. The trouble with that is, you, you know, many countries do not actually 
uh, reported very well. And so most estimates are somewhere th three to four times higher. And in fact, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and The Economist both did an attempt to look at excess mortality. And you can see this is reported deaths, five and a half million. But if you look at the IHME model, it's at least three times higher, more like around 12 and a half million. And the uh, economist model is almost 20 million deaths. Uh, and the thing about reporting is it's very much dependent upon the country. So there's been a lot of underreporting of deaths in, in Russia, in Mexico, in Egypt, and some of the African countries. And India in particular is way behind on reporting. So if you look at India's official report, only 500,000 people have died from COVID-19. Uh, but in fact, the estimates are more like around 5 million people, 10 times that amount. And a, another interesting study showed that whether, based on the, uh, the income level of the country, the reporting versus the excess deaths really track together. So higher income companies, or countries that actually report their deaths quite well and can track them are very close to the excess mortality numbers. But as you get to lower and lower econ uh, uh, socioeconomic countries, uh, the, the disparity is huge. So in low income case uh, countries, there's almost no reporting of deaths and that the estimates are actually quite high. So as we look back on the pandemic and try to compare it to other pandemics, you know, if you look at the worst one was, was the, the uh, 1918 flu, the Spanish flu, almost 1% of the world population uh, was infected and 75 million people died. Uh, the other influenza epidemics, pandemics in 57, 68, 2009, you know, there was one to three million deaths, but COVID-19, you know, the estimates are somewhere, even though we have recorded amount of 5.5, the estimates are around 12 to 20 million deaths. So it's really one of the, probably the second worst global pandemic in terms of mortality we've ever had. Uh, so, you know, as we look back on it, it was pretty devastating. And then, you know, we've argued a lot, well, we haven't, I've been saying vaccines have been great, saved a lot of people. There's individual arguments, but you know, we've had so many people vaccinated. Now there's been some studies looking at the population benefits of vaccination. And the British Medical Journal looked, uh, published, just published a paper on, uh, that was from the United States on 2,500 counties in 48 states. And they looked at 30.6 million cases of COVID-19 and 440,000 deaths. And they tried to look at, uh, correlate that with the, uh, the amount of uh, vaccination in those counties. And so the primary outcome of the study was mortality rates expressed as deaths per 100,000 per, per week. Uh, and, this, and then the secondary outcome was uh, infection rate. And basically what you see is the higher the infection, I mean, sorry, the higher the vaccination coverage, the lower the mortality and the lower uh, the infection rate. You can see here, it's almost you know a linear decline. And it's about for every 10% of uh, improvement in vaccination coverage, there was a reduction in 8% in mortality and 7% in infection rates. So, you know, this, this, is, this is irrefutable. Millions and millions of people. You can just see the vaccination rates have a huge impact on mortality and um, on incidence of, of infection. So, I mean, I don't know how many different ways you can say, you know, just vaccinations have been incredibly effective and have saved millions and millions of lives. Now, What's going on in terms of the variants now, you know, if you look at it, the BA1, the very first Omicron, is dark purple here, was, being, was about to be replaced by BA1.1529 and this other lighter purple. But the second ver version of Omicron, the BA2 variant, really dominated and basically prevented that one from emerging. So the BA2 variant became the dominant one. And now we have another one, BA2.1529. Uh, 12.1, that's beginning to emerge as another dominant variant. And each time they're a little bit more infectious, so they outcompete each other. We'll have to see if that leads to a bigger surge over the next, uh, over the summer. I hope not, but we, we'll just have to wait and see. Other couple, uh, other studies came out in the immune compromised uh, population. There was a study on vaccination and heart transplant that showed that people who were vaccinated uh, did better after heart transplant than people who weren't. Also, Moderna has now asked the FDA to authorize its vaccine for under six. So those are two important uh, studies. And there's been some news on antivirals. So uh, Paxlovid, which has been shown to be highly effective at reducing the risk of hospitalization or death, 
uh, was there was a study that tried to use it as a prophylactic. In other words, you know, just start taking it and seeing if it prevented, um, prevented infection. And they did it in two different ways, five doses or ten doses. And in both cases, it reduced uh, the infection rate by about a third, but neither one was statistically significant. So it's unlikely that Paxlovid will be used as a prophylactic, you know, in, in families to prevent you from getting the disease. And then in the other th uh, news in antiretrovirals is remdesivir has now been approved for younger kids uh, uh, for treatment of uh, high-risk kids in, in hospitals. So those are all, all uh, good news, but except for, <laughs> well, the Paxlovid wasn't good news. But anyway, uh, so, you know, there's another big impact of the disruption that COVID has had is it's prevented a lot of the normal vaccination of uh, vaccinations from having, uh, taking place in, in out, out there for kids. And, now all of a sudden, measles worldwide is up, worldwide is up almost 80%. And the thought is that because of the disruption COVID has had in the regular uh, care of, of kids, there's been less vaccination of them uh, for the usual vaccines. And so measles, which remember is even more infectious uh, than, uh, than SARS-CoV-2, it's the first thing where you'll see outbreaks. And so there is a big surge in, uh, in the country. So, Let's get to Lily's plan because Lily was very irritated about this. Now I don't want to say anything about it, but she, I told her she had to come up with a, you know, a good acronym, and this is her acronym. It's, ter it's terrible, but she's a dog, so she doesn't really know. But there were ten points. So the first one is, and all you know, Bill Gates aside, this is Lily's plan. First one is, it's called, in her words, pandemic diplomacy. Uh, you know, we all were down on the WHO, but there has to be some worldwide agency, maybe the WHO or some other one that comes out of this, that really is focused on detecting outbreaks, having a rapid response for containment, and then a scientific communication strategy. So when we know what it is, we're getting it out to the community. You know, the, the China was not very good. It was not very communicative in the beginning, but the scientists got the sequence out, so that helped. But you know, they, we can't repeat this. Uh, we need to have some better way of sharing information. The second thing is surveillance. Uh, we need to increase worldwide surveillance of animal reservoirs, you know, and that data needs to be available to all scientists. So that's a really important second point. The third one is our, it's pretty clear that public health infrastructure failed us, and so reinvesting in the CDC and our public health networks, both at the state and local levels, also creating uh, shared uh, databases for viral sequencing, and re-establishing uh, our vaccine trials network to make it easy to do clinical trials uh, as we have new antivirals. And frankly, her fourth, her fourth plan, her fourth part of the plan is, we've got to have better antiviral drugs. To me, and you know, the biggest disappointment was Paxlovid is late to the party. You know, we should have antivirals available all the time, and those drugs, th those kinds of development of those drugs needs to be subsidized by federal agencies. Um, one of the biggest disappointments in the vaccine world has been that the, the, we, we, you know, the warp speed was great, but it produced some very highly technical, difficult to uh, produce, and difficult to distribute vaccines. They're great for Western countries, but they're not very great for underdeveloped countries. And so we need to be thinking about developing low cost and stable vaccines from the outset. We have to understand, we need a global distribution. For that's the fifth point is low cost, stable vaccines. And the sixth point is global distribution. We, need, we now know how important global distribution is. There are whole parts of the world in India and Africa that have not been vaccinated fully. We need to figure that out. The seventh one is, uh, you know, we need to have strategic reserves for medical supplies. Obviously, we don't want to get caught flat-footed like we were for masks and other kinds of medical supplies, so we need strategic reserves around that, just like we have an oil strategic reserve. Uh, the World Bank, at number eight, has to figure out financial support for emerging economies that are struggling with uh, the uh, pandemic. The last two points are difficult, nine and ten. Misinformation. We should be able to develop algorithms to identify and respond to misinformation fairly quickly. And then the last point is communication. I think it's real obvious that the scientists did not do a great job of communicating to the public. So we need better communication skills and we need to figure out a way so we can get messages out to the public very consistently and ones that they can understand, we can, and ones that we can all understand. If it's confusing for me to watch experts on TV, it's got to be confusing, confusing for the public. So, we need to do a better job at that. And finally, I want to end today with a bunch of shout-outs. 
Uh, and I'm going to tell you one thing about the acronym. If you have a better acronym, please send it in to Lily because it's kind of embarrassing, but she doesn't know better. Uh, first of all, I want to thank a big shout out to Army veteran Roy Caldwaller. Recently gave us DeBakey VA and Baylor physician Dr. Barbara Trotner a unique honor by naming his newly born calf after her to thank her for the excellent care he had. So congratulations. I don't know if it's called the Barbara calf or the Troutner calf, but whatever he named it after her. I want to do a shout out to Dr. Susan Rosenberg, a professor of medical genetics at Baylor, who's been elected to the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This is a very important group and uh, gives her an opportunity to do great work uh, on that board. Uh, the third shout-out is to Dr. Bjorn Burkhart, a research associate at Baylor, who was selected as a recipient of the 2022 Marie Curie Global Fellowship, which is a very competitive award, and that's great. And finally, I want to thank uh, Lucy and Greg Kane, who sent me the most beautiful Havelina postcard to remind me of Nimick County, so thank you to the Canes. Anyway, have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you.